Coming up on Tech News Weekly, Jason Howell and I have quite a show. Uh, this week, we are talking to Renee Ritchie about a just announced, maybe going to happen project from Apple. Apple is reported to be working on a VR headset, which may sound different because we've heard a lot about an AR headset. So Renee Ritchie explains what's going on there. Then we talk to David Amell of Android Authority about the new Samsung Galaxy S21 Ultra. Yes, it is the brand new phone. What are the best features? What are maybe some features you can leave behind? And what are his overall thoughts about that device? Before we round things out with debuggers, Thomas Smith, to talk about crypto, mining, gardening, heating, and chickens? It is all that and so much more on this week's Tech News Weekly. Podcasts you love from people you trust. This, this is Twit. Twit. This is Tech News Weekly, episode 167, recorded Thursday, January 21st, 2021. This episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by Conga, conga.com slash twit. Experience Conga's new brand and have some fun by testing your trivia knowledge. They'll be donating to a charity that supports COVID relief efforts. Go to conga.com slash twit today. And by ESET, ESET protects businesses worldwide with internet security products and services backed by world-class research and tech support. Get your free ESET business trial and an interactive demo at business.eset.com slash twit and save 20% on ESET protect bundles for a limited time. Hello and welcome to Tech News Weekly, the show where every week we talk to and about the people making and breaking the tech news. I am one of your hosts, Micah Sargent. And, and in the I other corner, <laughs> it's me, Jason Howell. I was trying to mime uh, while you were doing the open, but that only really works if we're in the same room because Skype lag. Yeah, that lag just kind of ruins things. But uh, we're does. both here, and despite the lag, we've got a lot to talk about, so we should jump right into it. Uh, I believe just this morning, let me check my sources here. Yes, January 21st, 2021, at 3 a.m. Pacific time, uh, Mark Gurman published a story in Bloomberg uh, detailing what what he believes, what sources close to the situation believe uh, to be a f Apple's first dip into uh, virtual reality and maybe a tiny bit of augmented reality. And who better, who better to come on the show and talk to us about um, potential future maybe kind of plans from Apple and all things Apple in general. Uh, I am excited to say that Renee Ritchie is joining us today. Hello, Renee. Hello, Micah. It's always great to talk to you. And it's always great to talk to you and see your beautiful uh, setup there. I just, uh, the, the lights, it's just all so good. You look so great, jealous. pal. I've set envy. <laughs> um, so... Let us begin. Uh, Apple, and I think that this is actually where we should start because I remember you and I both both used to work together um, at a lo little company called iMore. And while I was there, and I believe you were still there, yeah, yeah, you were still there. Um, we, I would occasionally. Um, listen to the financial earnings reports. And while listening, I would turn them into a transcript so that people could go back and look at them later. Uh, and, you know, for accessibility reasons as well. Um, and while overall, not a super fun thing to do, what was <laughs> fun was seeing some of the trends that came out of that. And there were two trends, two things that uh, you would routinely hear the, the leaders of Apple kind of talk about. And one was services, 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 which we've seen quite a bit uh, of new services. And the other was Tim Cook hinting at the future of a are. Uh, and so what I'd love for you to do, Renee, is can you tell our listeners kind of uh, as we go back looking through things, 
Apple's kind of history of talking about augmented reality and Tim Cook in particular talking about augmented reality to kind of set the scene before we talk about this uh, VR headset? Yeah, for sure. Tim Cook will almost always tell you that Apple doesn't, a Apple meaning him because uh, he's the boss. Apple doesn't talk about or comment on future products or rumors or speculation, except when he, as the boss, chooses to. But I think he's <laughs> really specific about it, notably in two interrelated areas. One is machine learning, which is equivalent to software. I think he just talks about that because it's like talking about Apple making software in the future. And the other, like you said, is augmented reality. And I think he does that because Apple sees it as being equivalent to talking about display in the future. You know, it's no secret Apple has a lot of devices with displays like iPhones and Macs and iPads and all of this. And they seem to believe that machine learning will be just an integral part of software and augmented reality be an integral part of hardware going forward. So they want to sort of be in that conversation. They want investors to know they're on it and they can do it in a way that is completely nonspecific about eventual shipping products. That makes sense. So this is kind of saying, hey, we know that this is where uh, things are going and we're letting you know that we know and wink, wink, we're, you know, we're on it. Um, so that, all the that, mind I mean, screens, that, all the mind screens. Ex <laughs> exactly. So then let's talk about um, the specifics here, because uh, I think another building block that we need to talk about is Apple's AR kit. Can you explain what AR kit is to listeners? And uh, if you have that bit of trivia, when Apple launched it and how it has improved that technology over time? Sure. So I'm not sure when the first release version came out. It went into beta at WWDC around the same time Pokemon Go you know, became a thing. And we started seeing layered information. Google's been very big on this too. So the difference between AR and VR is VR replaces reality around you. It wraps your eyes in a screen and immerses you in a whole new world and environment where AR, augmented reality, seeks to layer information on top of the existing world. It's transparent. It's see-through. So it could be a little Pikachu running around or it could be directions on a map or notification bubbles, text messages, all those things. And what AR Kit did was start to bridge the gap between developers and that hardware. Apple has this real interesting way of introducing technologies to developers that seem par for the course and then revealing that they're they're linchpins into upcoming hardware. And it's not always a master plan. It's just sometimes they need something and they go, oh, we we have that already. But I think in this case, they very specifically wanted to work towards a world that where we have wearable augmented reality, but they knew they had to do so much testing. The only way to do that was on existing devices. So AR could start it off as a way to put very simple, very crude layers on top of reality. There was some vertical and some horizontal uh, mapping and some lighting, and it's quickly evolved. They've been evolving it aggressively year over year. They added diagonal and they added real tight surface tracking and all sorts of shadow tracing. And now they've got these point clouds where you can mix them with Apple Maps and have like Gundam appear on the Twit Studios and engage in a robot battle if you want to right in front of your eyes. And I think that's the part where it gets really interesting. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, now you've got you've got all these devices out there that support augmented reality in some way. Uh, it's not only a way for Apple to kind of test this technology and test it with developers and see what developers can create, but it's also a way to kind of uh, push forward, I think, the idea of augmented reality into uh, folks' everyday lives and better understand what it is and kind of get the, the basis of it before it, it carries on. Um, but when we look at these sort of, um, be, be it augmented reality or virtual reality, I think, you know, XR is the term, um, fill in the blank there. There is still kind of a, a, a niche uh, feeling to all of it. And, you know, I, I certainly uh, have a VR headset and have used it and have enjoyed it. And um, our mutual friend, Georgia Dow, is huge into VR, loves VR. Yeah. Um, but it still kind of feels like it's on the outside of things. And so um, let's, let's then get into this report uh, from um, Bloomberg's Mark Gurman because... It appears that Apple, according to sources, is working on a VR headset. 
And so I'm curious, you know, the, the narrative here that, that German has put forward is that this is the first step that will then eventually lead to AR. So, I mean, I guess I've got some more questions about that specifically, but could you kind of give us some details about what this VR headset is, this is alleged VR headset and kind of what uh, German says are Apple's plans here? Yeah, and I mean, this this doesn't sound too dissimilar to what they did with the original iPhone when they had the Purple Experience project. And that is, you know, they always wanted what we have today as an iPhone, but they weren't sure how long it would take to bring to market. So they hedged their bets with an iPod phone that had a click wheel as sort of a rotary dialer, thinking that they might have to ship that first. And, you know, they didn't. I think luckily for all of us, they didn't. But this sounds like the AR glasses, the augmented reality glasses that Apple really wants, that they think is the future of wearables, are still many years away. And so the VR headset, it might end up being an entertainment product on its own, absolutely. But that is a more near future product that could also help them solve some of the problems. Because releasing any of these products, as we've seen from a lot of the people from Magic Leap to... um, to Oculus, to HTC Vive, all of these different companies, has PlayStation VR, there's a lot of technological hurdles still to overcome. And it might simply be that Apple thinks they need an actual head-mounted product in the market, even if it's niche, even if it's expensive, to start overcoming those problems. So the classic narrative around Apple is that Apple is a uh, sort of no, no, you go first kind of company and that other companies iterate out in the open and then Apple uh, kind of watches and improves upon and steps out with uh, the more perfected, more uh, figured out version of that technology. But this would kind of speak to not that. And so do we do we need to get past that narrative uh, that Apple is kind of a, okay, you, you all go and we'll see how this works? Or is Apple more open to, you know, being that you watch Apple so closely, uh, is Apple more open to kind of iterating in public and experimenting with technology in public or maybe was that narrative inaccurate in the first place? No, I think it's, I mean, obviously in the early days with like the, the first Apple One and Apple II, they were early to market, uh, even with the Mac and GUIs. But with the, there was a decade of smartphones before the iPhone and a decade of tablet PCs before the iPad. The Apple Watch didn't quite have that much time. There was the Pebble and the Fitbit, but there wasn't a decade of smartwatches. So I think it really depends on when Apple decides to get into the market. To your point, they typically prefer to look at how existing products are used and most notably what problems consumers have with them, what sort of rough edges that they feel Apple is ideally positioned to offer a superior experience. That's usually the Tim Cook doctrine. Apple can enter a market where they can provide a highly differentiated experience that they believe provides significant value. That's typically why they enter so few markets. But in this case, the level of complexity might just be so high that even though there has been all those products, Magic Leap and Oculus and uh, Google Glass and Microsoft, you know, all of these products in the market already, we're still not that much closer to a mainstream consumer solution. And so they might feel like a little bit of impetus to enter the market earlier than they might otherwise like to. I uh, have the Quest. I have the Quest 2. I love the experience. But like you said earlier, Micah, you know, VR still feels like it's on the outside looking in hasn't quite reached that point. And I could totally see Apple making that happen. What what I get confused about when I think of Apple getting into VR, like I would have been less surprised if I saw that like this was all about AR because that makes more sense to me. But Apple getting into VR um, is confusing to me because I don't see Apple as like a gaming company. Mm-hmm. Like I guess there's Apple Arcade. And then I guess when you take media content, like streaming content, you have Apple Plus now. So Apple has kind of expanded into these other entertainment type categories. But do you think this is about gaming or is this about something bigger than that? So Mark suggests it's sort of like on three pillars. You have gaming, you have entertainment, you have communication. And to your point, I have the Oculus too. I don't 
I stopped using it because of Facebook's recent policy changes where, mm-hmm. like with so many of their services, they said, we will never conflate Facebook IDs with the product that you bought before Facebook was involved with it. But I think that's also an area where Apple could differentiate and say, yes, we have this product, but our version is completely privacy centric. We are not using it as a low-key creep way to map your house while you're playing fun and games. And I think that for a certain segment of customers will be valuable. But yeah, yeah. absolutely. Apple has stuck with casual gaming. I don't want to call it low effort, but it's definitely a high ROI. It's like Candy Crush all the things. And so <laughs> I'm not worried that there'll be Candy Crush on this day one, but they haven't shown much affinity or not much. There are a ton of high-end hardcore gamers at every level of Apple, including the top, but they haven't seen value in pursuing that market. There are rumors they want to get into it, especially with the next generation Apple TV, to the extent that they might even buy some studios that they've been buying content mm for TV Plus and the way Microsoft and Sony and everyone has been buying studios. But I don't have confidence in Apple doing that yet. They would have to very, very much prove that they're good at it before I'd, I'd really write yeah. them in. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a really good question, Jason, because, uh, yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I, I kind of heard your hesitancy there as you started to think about Apple Arcade. But I wanted to, you know, sort of back that up and say, even as someone who pays attention to Apple on the reg, uh, I it's still I don't ever I've never seen it as a gaming company. Um, mm-hmm. Yes, it it does seem you know Apple got into Apple purchased a business that acquired a business that uh, did concerts I think it was yep. and so you could you you know go to these concerts in VR and I have to think about because uh, I've cited you before Renee on this point um, where people were talking about Apple's potential to do air tags which are these um, these little tracking devices that help you find lost things is kind of the idea so you stick them to your keys like uh, tile or tracker and you pointed out that you know, a lot of times Apple uh, may have a product, but feels like the market isn't ripe for that product. And so it is not going to release it until it makes sense for that product to be released. And so then we look at this product and with folks at home and more so than ever, and with um, the call for a non-Facebook virtual reality device, there are these little hints and tidbits that do point to uh, this potentially being something successful. But I guess the, the final question that I have for you is, do you feel that Apple is releasing uh, or is is working on this as a product all its own, you know, virtual reality going forth with that and, you know, really putting its efforts into that? Or is this just a stair step uh, between what we have now and its eventual plans for augmented reality? And if it is a stair step, is that is that a problem? Do we think that the you know the virtual reality part of this might not be as good or might not be as compelling because the the idea is to get to AR in the end? I think if this ends up being a shipping product, it would very much be the Apple TV to the augmented reality iPhone, where it would be more of a niche, more of a location-based experience and not something quite as ubiquitous. But also, like I keep reminding myself when you hear about Apple special project groups like this project and like the Apple car, that if we had Mark Gurman's back in 2005, we'd be hearing Steve Jobs <laughs> live it at wife's friend from Microsoft, braggadocious tablet dreams, vows Apple will make a tablet, tablet project scrapped, <laughs> Apple now making iPod dialer yeah, phone, yeah, iPod dialer point, phone fails, point. Apple releasing iPhone. Like it would be so much drama that we just never saw. So I think every right. project is like this. We just hear about it more now. Great point. That makes sense. That makes yeah, that makes perfect sense. Well, Renee Ritchie, uh, of course, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. You're always a delight to have on, and uh, I do appreciate you being here. If folks want to follow you online and check out the awesome stuff you're doing, where do they go to do that? Well, first, I love talking to you and Jason anytime, any opportunity. You can find me at Renee Ritchie on Twitter, on YouTube, and that is where I post almost daily videos. And Mac awesome. Break Weekly, of course, every week with Leo and yeah, Andy. absolutely. Well, thank you, Renee. We appreciate it. Thank you, Renee. Thank you so much.
<laughs> Take care. We'll talk to you soon. All right, coming up, David Immel from Android Authority has the new Samsung Galaxy S21 Ultra. Posted his <gasps> review about it this morning, so we're going to talk all about that. But you're going to have to wait for a few minutes because we want to thank the sponsor of today's episode, and that is Conga. If you're ready to evolve your operations or if you want to st uh, streamline your workflows, create and deliver digital documents, quotes, contracts, all of that more effectively, well, that's what Conga is all about. Conga helps businesses digitally transform their commercial operations. So, you know, other companies out there, they may be stepping away from opportunities like this, but Conga actually believes this is the perfect time to keep moving forward. The manual processes uh, that were once conducted in person and in office, the things that we don't do a whole lot of these days, obviously came to a halt uh, when the pandemic hit. And businesses really found themselves uh, limiting that contact and working from home, like, like I feel like so many of us are doing right now. We'll all head back to our offices, thankfully, eventually, at least I'm crossing my fingers, but the need need for digital transformation has catapulted uh, from an aspiration to a non-negotiable requirement. And Conga offers the most robust solution uh, for digital document process and commercial excellence transformation. They have an end-to-end -end digital document transformation suite actually helps you automate and optimize your daily documents uh, and contracts to, of course, save time, but also close your business faster uh, and empower your teams to work with more purpose. Conga Composer, which is a way to power up your customer engagement uh, with Composer. Digital document generation from Salesforce is super quick. It's error-free every time. You're creating beautiful templated documents directly from Salesforce. Uh, you can automate your templated documents so they'll always be built with exactly the right data and information. And documents will be accurate. So you're pulling data from your CRM or any system of record, and you're not getting any errors in the process. You can deliver documents in a variety of formats by almost any method and store where you want. And then, of course, there's advanced features for Composer Enterprise. You get real-time document notifications uh, that actually reveal recipient engagement and make follow-up even easier and more simple. With Conga Batch, you can consolidate, schedule, and deliver the documents that you create with Composer. Uh, so you can choose how, uh, how you want to launch and send, of course, whether automatically or on demand, and even do so for multiple documents all at once. Composer's add-on Conga Trigger will let you create and distribute digital documents automatically from Composer and Salesforce without having to click a button every single time. T-Mobile for Business saved time and money using Conga. T-Mobile sales reps didn't have the necessary key capability in their sales proposals. Their customers couldn't see the proposals in writing or they had to create additional documents that were time-consuming and caused errors. Well, with Conga Composer, T-Mobile sales operations and promotions have never been clearer, easier, or more beautiful. What once took, you know, 24 to 48 hours just to file a case and request a ticket is now an instant report. Talk about time savings. Uh, sales teams now avoid multiple systems, and T-Mobile has seen a 25% increase in user adoption. They're getting paid faster, in other words. So Conga is committed to improving how people do business at a much larger scale with additional resources. They know we are all in this together. So experience Conga's new brand and have some fun at conga.com slash twit. You can test your knowledge of trivia and share on social. Conga will take the results and will donate it to a charity that's supporting COVID relief efforts. How about that? That's conga.com slash twit. And we welcome Conga and thank them for their support of Tech News Weekly. All right. Last week, last, uh, well, yeah, a week ago today, we talked about it a little bit last week on the show. Samsung introduced the world to its latest, pre uh, latest uh, premium flagship device, the Galaxy S21 Ultra. And like I said earlier, David Immel from Android Authority published his full review uh, just a few hours ago and is here to talk all about it. Welcome to the show, David. Hello, hello. I, uh, I'm glad to be on, back on. It's been a hot minute since I've been here. I think the last time I was on, I was uh, in Japan in, 
it was very loud. So I apologize. <laughs> retro apologize retroactively for that. But uh, yeah. that, that's right. I think you were because you do a lot of travel. You were in Japan at a hostel, and right at showtime, <laughs> the how the the like uh, the cleaners of the hostel started the cleaner getting to work. Lady. Yeah, you can't yeah. quite tell them to not clean. Like that's just what they do. So, uh, well, it's all good. We're happy to get you anytime we can, David, and especially today. Um, obviously, the S twenty one Ultra. I'm always interested in uh, Samsung's you know flagship devices, but this is like the premium of the of the next premium uh, series. And uh, I've I've really enjoyed the last two Ultras, and right now I actually have the uh, Note twenty Ultra. So I'm yeah. hoping to get the S twenty one Ultra in my hands to play around with it. Uh, so reading your review uh, really intrigued me, um, simply because I like what Samsung does with their Ultra series. So if you had to pick just like one feature that that almost shines or sparkles brighter than the rest on this device, one thing that you walked away from this from your review uh, with saying, okay, this is the thing, what is it? I think it's probably the 10X optical telephoto lens system that they have in this phone. Um, I brought the phone along with me so you can kind of see it right here if I can get the angle right. But oh, basically they... Yeah, they have a re-engineered 108 megapixel sensor, which is fine. You know, they've got a 3x optical telephoto sensor that we've seen in a lot of cameras, but that 10x optical telephoto lens system we've only seen in a couple of phones before, uh, most notably the Huawei P40 Pro Plus. But as you know, uh, Huawei phones don't have Google Play services. So if you want right. to get an Android phone that can actually use most of Android's core features, uh, this is one of the only phones you can get right now that has the 10x optical telephoto uh, lens system. So, and it's it's so good. Uh, I compared it against against the Huawei P40 Pro Plus's 10x optical telephoto camera, and as well as other phones that have like 5x optical. And the clarity that you get from an optical telephoto camera system is so nice. So um, that's probably the standout feature for me for sure. Yeah, I, I am always all about uh, getting a, a higher rated optical zoom on a device. I think from a usability standpoint, like you can, if you had to pick and choose, like I would choose the optical zoom over the like ultra wide if you had to choose. The thing about mm -hmm. the ultra is that you don't have to choose. You kind of get them all. And in this case, you yeah. get the 3x optical and the 10x optical. So you've got some choices. Now, do those what I want to understand the 100x because I know on the S20 Ultra and the Note 20 Ultra, the space zoom, as Samsung likes to call it, which is 100x. It's not optical, obviously. It's a, it's kind of a mm -hmm. hybrid, I think, of optical and digital. Mm -hmm. But I mean, any of the examples that I've seen from that before and from my testing were incredibly unusable. I mean, it's it's yeah. interesting <laughs> that they can do it, but you're never going to hang that up on your wall or even be really comfortable posting that to your Instagram feed. You know, it just kind of looks murky and weird. Um, has that improved here? Are they using these two optical zooms like in tandem to create a better space zoom? How does that work? Yeah, so so it's, it's improved quite a lot, actually. So Previously in the S20 Ultra, they were using information from that 108 megapixel isocell main sensor to kind of like add artificial data into the, they had a 4X optical telephoto sensor before. So when you would zoom in towards 100X, it would kind of artificially enhance that by taking information from the wider 108 megapixel sensor. This year, um, everything between the 3X optical telephoto uh, sensor and the 10X optical telephoto system kind of uses like an AI um, blending thing to make all of that range better. And then af everything after 10X, it uses a combination of the 10X optical telephoto lens and again, that 108 megapixel sensor. But this is a re-engineered sensor. So this is the HM3 ISOCELL from Samsung. Um, it's got better low light performance. It's got better focusing performance, which is really good because one of the main pain points in the S20 Ultra was the fact that it couldn't focus on like anything. Um, but mm -hmm. they have also added a better OIS system into the 10X optical telephoto lens system, which is really important because when you have a lens that long, it's very hard to stay steady. Um, so that in combination with kind of a new like warp stabilizer that they added, it's uh, it basically ta again takes the information from the 108 megapixel sensor and then helps you stabilize that 10x lens when you're zoomed in past 30x. And that helps tremendously. You can see like a little bit of wave warp when you're zoomed in to like 100% or 100x. Uh, but it's so much more stable for one thing than the S20 Ultra and then the quality in general, across the board is just way better. The contrast is better, the clarity is better, the sharpness is better. Um, I've got some comparisons on the website actually and in my video that I did 
which is a 24 minute video because there's so much to talk about in the phone. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, the quality the quality is just drastically better in my opinion. I think if you want to get a phone that is like a total telescope that can go from 0.6x to 100x, it's amazing. Now, I still wouldn't post 100x photos, like you said, like on my Instagram, because they're still, yeah. you know, every, anyone would see that photo and they're going to be like, oh, why is that kind of blurry? But it's not like yeah. last year where it was like, is this like an oil painting that I don't right. really know what the subject is, you know, like <laughs> um, absolutely. this year it's, it's much better this year. So. Yeah. OK. And that, and you know what? Honestly, that gives me hope. This is how I felt about that feature anyways. It's like, OK, last year, it's interesting that you can do it this year. OK, does it look better? Yeah, it actually looks a lot better. That tells me that like in a couple of years, this is going to be really impressive. Like oh, consider yeah. and, and I don't think it's ever going to be like the same as an optical zoom. But I think we're going to get in a very short amount of time, depending, you know, uh, based on what we've seen already from Samsung, we're going to get to a point where we're like, I can't believe that's a hundred X digital zoom, but it is right. and it looks really good. So it is crazy. You can see things using the hundred X zoom that you just cannot even come close to seeing with your naked eye. So it really does work as like a telescope, right? Like I was taking a photo of a clock tower that was super far away and there was no way that I could read what time it was just looking at the tower. But if I use yeah. the phone, you could actually read the time. Whereas on the S 20 ultra, you couldn't really read what time it was. So it was pretty insane. Yeah, yeah. Where uh, where does this stumble? If you had to pick like a, a real pain point of like, eh, Samsung, you really missed missed the ball here. Um, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I feel like the S twenty one Ultra really cleaned up most of the problems the S twenty Ultra had, which were kind of a lot. Um, the S twenty Ultra had major focusing problems with its main sensor, which Samsung said it was going to fix with software, and they issued a couple patches, but that didn't really do much. Uh, so that's been drastically improved. They they fixed the lens system. Um, the battery life's a little better. I think one thing that people are going to complain about is the fact that Samsung has now removed the micro SD card expansion from the phone. Mm -hmm. um, and it's kind of just like another step away from kind of the power user phones that Samsung used to make for everybody. You know, like the S line and the yep. Note line. Like the, I tell everybody all the time, like, the S10 Plus is still one of my favorite phones, um, and it's like one of the last in the legacy of Samsung phones that has a headphone jack and micro SD card expansion and and just kind of all the bells and whistles um, besides the removal of a battery. But the other thing that where this kind of stumbles at, I would say, is video. Um, in general, it's good, and then like the 4K 60 video is good. But in any situation where you're going to have like a lot of contrast or detail or sharp lines. So if you're around water, if you're around a lot of brick, if you're around a lot of grass, like anything that will have a lot of detail, you get a lot of more, you get a lot of noise. Um, I think that's something, something that Samsung needs to clean up a little bit. I think one of the reasons it does that is because Samsung used to go really hard with the noise reduction, like way yeah. too hard with the noise reduction, and it made people look really plasticky. And uh, mm -hmm. that was kind of an issue. The S20 or the Note 20 series, uh, changed both the color science and then also how they did noise reduction. And I think they went down on the noise reduction to make people look a little bit sharper. But unfortunately, um, when you have small camera sensors and small lenses and plastic lenses and it's just not optically perfect like that, you're going to get noise. So I think it's going to take a generation or two for them to tweak it. Um, I am impressed with, with what I see so far, though. I am excited for the future there. Yeah. Um, one other thing that I want to ask you about is the S Pen. Uh, this is the first Galaxy S series phone that is not a Note that supports the S Pen. Um, yeah. And you, you wrote that the S Pen here is a little bit different than what you get in the Note. The Note is more active experience. And I correct me if I'm wrong, but the Pro, the S Pen Pro that isn't out yet, that's going to be an active pen from what, I, what I've heard about it. Yeah. Do, do mm -hmm. you think... Like what I'm trying to figure out is, is this the replacement for the Note or is this just Samsung saying, hey, people like the S Pen. Why not give support for it in our Ultra on the on the Galaxy S series? And then the Note is for like the hardcore S Pen user. Like what what direction do you think Samsung's going to go in? I'm pretty sure they're going in a multi-year transition to get rid of the Galaxy Note. Um, okay. I made a I made a video like six months ago or when the S, the Note 20 Ultra dropped saying, is this the last Galaxy Note or should it be the last Galaxy Note? Because every year, like Samsung has too many premium phones now, right? I think that's the yeah. issue. They have got the S line and they have a bunch of phones in the S line now and they're all kind of premium. 
And actually, this year we saw them scale that back a little bit, whereas last year they were all super premium. All the notes are super premium. Now they have more than just the Ultra. They also have um, the regular note, and I don't – do they have the Plus anymore? I can't remember if they got rid of the Plus with the note. Um, but then you've got yeah, – I don't think the they have flip. the Plus with the note. Yeah, no, no, no Plus anymore. But now you've got the Z Flip and the Z Fold. And I think the direction they see going with the Z Fold is to be an actual little notebook in your pocket, right? That makes a lot of sense. We saw yeah. the quality of the screen and the, the toughness of the screen get way better just going from one generation from the Galaxy Z Fold 1 to the Galaxy Z Fold 2. Um, and I think the long goal there is to add an S Pen, you know, uh, make support for keyboards better. They eventually want to give you a little foldable Android laptop tablet hybrid in your pocket. And it would make so much sense. Um, so it doesn't really make sense to still have the Note line for that reason. So I, I think them adding it to the Ultra is half gauging interest to see mm. how much do people actually use the pen, right? Because like it's hard for them to get that data when people buy notes. They're like, oh, people are buying notes, so they're interested in notes. But totally. maybe they're buying notes for all the other reasons. Like I think the Note design is always way better. Like I love the more squared off design that the Galaxy Note usually has. Um, but for the S Pen thing, it, it is weird because they have the, the regular S Pen for this, which it, it's bigger than a Note S Pen. And it has like the the close distance communication protocol mm -hmm. where it can kind of like you can hover over things and it'll bring up menus, but you can't do any of the Bluetooth gestures or any stuff like that. And then they're going to release the Pro, which is crazy because the regular S Pen already costs forty dollars, and then there's the cases, and <laughs> it, it, it feels very beta. It feels like they kind of decided yeah. this at the at sort of the last minute because the cases that they made for the Ultra that hold the S Pen feel very clunky. Like one of them is just uh, silicone and it has like a little slot for the pen in the side, but it's really hard to get it out and push it back in. Um, and then one of them is like a bifold and it's not super high quality and they're really expensive. Like the pen itself is $40. If you get it with the silicone one, it's 70. And if you get it with the bifold, it's 90. <laughs> um, wow. Wow. But it's, a, yeah. yeah. I, but again, like if you pre-order an S20, uh, one ultra, you get a two hundred dollar Samsung credit. So I think that's true. Their hope, I think their hope is that you can use that on a case with the pen, and they want to see how many people are interested in it before moving mm -hmm. forward. But I think the long game to answer your question, I think the long game is to move it into the the fold series, um, and just kind of see if the pen can be a kind of an optional accessory for all of their phones. Because we've seen pens get more popular recently, right? Like uh, the mm -hmm. LG Velvet supports uh, Wacom input and like more more phones are supporting pens in one way or another so you know I think they're they they see the writing on the wall of phones becoming more like little pocket computers and they just kind of want to make them as functional as they can yeah yeah that makes sense um so David you wrote this review on Android Authority everybody should go check it out like David says a very substantial video review but then also <laughs> a very substantial article I think you, you tweeted that you wrote about 5,000 words for this review so uh, it's yeah. all really good as as your writing always is uh, but I want to end with one other thing that you tweeted this morning you announced uh, that you're stepping away from Android Authority you've been there for five years uh, and I want to give you the opportunity to talk about what's next for you because it sounds really exciting. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I was approached by uh, Marcus Brownlee a few uh, weeks ago now. It moved so fast. Um, <laughs> honestly, it moved so fast. It was like he emailed me and I'd signed on with him by the end of the week. Um, but uh -huh. yeah, no, I mean, I've been at Android Authority for five years and it's been great. Obviously, like it's given me an amazing platform to both write about technology and learn that I actually like making videos, which I had no idea I enjoyed. Um, you know, I've got to travel the world with it and it's been amazing, but Marquez wants to bring me on as like a writer researcher role. Um, obviously it's going to be very fluid, so I'll be shooting and editing and, you know, helping with the podcast and all that stuff. Um, but it'll be fun. I mean, I know, I know everybody on his team already. And I think one thing that a lot of people, like you mentioned at the beginning of the show, you can't wait to get back into the office, right? And the last time I had a job where I was around people, uh, besides, you know, I, I live with Michael Fisher, so we get to bounce ideas off of each other all the time. <laughs> but uh -huh. Uh -huh. the last time I had a job where I was like around people all the time was um, in like 2015 when I worked at Intel. And I didn't love that job, but it wasn't the same. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited different. to go work with 
all those guys that are on that team are just so incredibly creative and um, it's going to be yeah. pretty different, you know, cause I won't be a reporter really anymore. Like I will be in this in a sense, but it'll be just, it'll be different. So, but it'll be fun, different. you know, and, and you I'm never know what that opens up and stuff too. So what was that? I'm yeah. sorry. I stepped on, I stepped on. I'll probably be spinning up my own channel and be writing on the side for different blogs and whatever and freelancing. So I'll probably still be all over the internet, but that will be I'm my sure. new main thing which is uh, exciting and scary at the same time. <laughs> yeah, well, if it isn't scary, then it's probably not worth doing, right? Like, it's good to challenge exactly. yourself, and sometimes opportunities like that come along, and yeah, it's good to take the chance and see where it leads, because five years from now, you, you could look back and be like, oh, that was the that was the turning point, whatever it may be. Yeah. So um, okay. I'm excited for you, David. Uh, that sounds really Thank exciting. You. I love your work. Uh, I think Mark has picked the right person to be on his team, right? Uh, so uh, good on you. And uh, thank you so much for taking time to chat with us today about the S21 Ultra. People want to follow you online. Where can they find you? Uh, you should head over to twitter.com. Uh, my handle is at DervidML. And um, I know it's a little complicated, but I couldn't get the <laughs> just at David Amell handle. Um, <laughs> my writing will for and videos will forever live on Android Authority. So there's that. Um, but I am trying to host a lot of my stuff or at least have backlinks to my work all kind of congregated on my website, which is just davidamell.com. Um, yeah, you can tweet at me and I generally respond because I'm addicted to this website like most of us. So. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you so much, David. It's good to see you, and we'll talk to you soon. Good luck in the new role. Thank you. Let's talk soon. All right. Bye-bye. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Congratulations, David. All right. Coming up, throw out the scarf and mittens and wheel in the crypto miner. We are warming up, folks. A little more on that in a moment. But first, I want to tell you about ESET. Look, we've been relying on ESET for years here at Twit. It offers enterprise-grade security that's easy to manage for a small business like Twit. And it has a light system footprint that never slows you down. ESET has had two exciting new developments recently. Uh, they just introduced the brand new endpoint security management platform called ESET Protect. And one of the main features in the new ESET Protect cloud, which offers easy cloud-based management for businesses of all sizes with no restrictions on seat size. ESET Protect also takes security to a whole new level with new bundled products. These new bundles feature enhanced protection against ransomware and zero-day threats, plus full disk data encryption capabilities for Windows and for Mac OS. Right now, you out there listening right now can save 20% on all these new bundles. So you're not only getting best in class, cloud-managed protection against advanced attacks, you're also enjoying a significant discount. It's just, it's all good for small businesses and MSPs we recommend ESET Protect Advanced, the bundle that has all the security you need along with a cloud-based management console. ESET Protect Advanced includes endpoint protection platforms, uh, cloud sandboxing for advanced threat detection and prevention, full disk encryption, and file server security plus a cloud-based console. If you prefer on-prem management rather than cloud-based, ESET Protect also offers that option. Either way, you're going to be getting powerful, reliable security based on 30 years of research and innovation. You out there listening right now, I just talked to you, I'm talking to you again, can get a free trial and an interactive demo, um, that sounds exciting, at business.eset.com slash twit. ESET just earned top ratings in AV Comparative's Endpoint Prevention and Response Comparative Report. In testing of nine vendors, ESET not only achieved the highest combined prevention and response score in the test, but also demonstrated outstanding overall detection and reporting capabilities. ESET earned the top rating of Strategic Leader, signifying a product that has a very high return on investment, low total cost of ownership, and exceptional technical capabilities. This is one of the most comprehensive tests of endpoint detection and response solutions and endpoint security products ever conducted by this independent testing organization. So these are some very impressive results. Now, remember, get your free ESET business trial and an interactive demo at business.eset.com twit. 
And you're going to save 20% on ESET Protect bundles with this limited time offer. Trust ESET to future-proof your business. Our thanks to ESET for sponsoring this week's episode of Tech News Weekly. We do appreciate it. And thank you for that great offer. Awesome. Thank you, ESET. All right. It's time to talk a little bit about crypto mining. Uh, no, we're not going to help you get rich uh, with Bitcoin, but we are going to maybe heat up your room or maybe your chicken coop. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> crypto mining PCs actually put off a ton of heat, uh, enough heat to grow tomatoes, as we're about to find out. Joining us to talk about the heat that he created is Thomas Smith, CEO of Gato Images, who's been writing about his journey around taking the heat and the energy used by crypto mining machines and kind of diverting that in really creative ways. Welcome back to the show, Tom. Thank you for having me. Really happy to be here. Yeah, it's good to get you back. And uh, I, I love, uh, I wasn't aware that you were going down this road. You, you contacted us and said, hey, check out what I've been doing. And then when I started to kind of read into it, this has been a project that you've been working on for a while, at least a year. Actually, I think your initial blog post or your initial post uh, on Medium was almost exactly a year ago where you were kind of like spitballing ideas around what you would do here. <laughs> so, um, so before all that, what came first, the desire to garden or the desire to crypto mine? <laughs> I think the desire to garden, really. Um, yeah. So as I shared in the piece, uh, my, my three-year-old son got really into gardening uh, over the last summer. And I'm a terrible gardener. I kill plants. Um, I have no you know, knowledge or skill there whatsoever. So it was kind of a challenge. I was like, well, we want to encourage this, but, you know, how can I do that? Um, and, you know, I realized what I can do is tech um, and I can, you know, bring in all these tech concepts. So starting in January, around January of um, 2020, you know, right before the pandemic, we started building this um, garden in our garage. And we, I thought, you know, bring in all these tech concepts, we'll build a hydroponic system, um, we'll experiment with different kinds of solar power and, you know, recycled water and that kind of thing. And we set up a garden. Um, obviously, the timing was great uh, because, you know, we, we were able to use this all through the pandemic. Um, and it was a great project, but, you know, I realized, okay, it's the dead of winter. It's the middle of February. And by the time we had this thing up and running and, you know, even here in California, it gets into the forties at night, sometimes down to the thirties. So it was chilly and tomatoes really need to be at a pretty high temperature. It's what we were growing, um, you know, to, to thrive. So I started to think, well, it's a tech oriented way that we can, um, heat this little greenhouse that we built. And what I kind of arrived at was, um, you know, let's build a cryptocurrency mining computer. Um, let's run it at full blast and let's pipe the heat from it into the greenhouse and uh, use that to grow our tomatoes. So we did. And uh, as I shared in the story, it actually worked really well. <laughs> So, okay, so you you built this crypto mining PC. Uh, talk a little bit about the technology components that went into that. How how exactly did you build that? What were, I mean, are you using like a Raspberry Pi, something uh, stronger or uh, beefier than that? What are you using? Yeah, I just, so I got a, um, uh, you know, custom computer kit. I think it was from Newegg. Um, and I put in an NVIDIA 1070 graphics card, uh, which is one of the sort of standards at the time. And I think people still are using them for crypto mining. Um, just a pretty basic motherboard connected up to that. Um, and then, you know, pretty, pretty simple just a, a network card. And I've experimented with a couple of different, um, you know, systems to do the mining, using some algorithms directly, joining mining pools. Uh, I ended up using the software NiceHash though, um, which is sort of, you know, uh, really easy. You just start it up, you press a button and, uh, and it starts mining for you. And, nice. um, I ended up, uh, yeah, experimenting a little bit with underclocking and overclocking that NVIDIA graphics card to dial in the, uh, the balance between how much power I was using and how much heat I was pumping out into the greenhouse. And not only did you grow tomatoes, uh, you I mean, I, it must have been an evolution. At some point, you're now you're heating a chicken coop, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, so yeah, started out with the tomatoes, um, and then recently moved into a new house. Um, and one of the other things we did over the pandemic, 
uh, was to get chickens. And um, the Times was, I think, May of 2020. We thought we were being so brilliant and creative and, you know, original and getting chickens. <laughs> Apparently, backyard chicken ownership increased 500 percent um, during the pandemic. So we were not alone in, uh, in doing that. But, um, yeah, you can see my chickens, Anna and Elsa, there. Um, and we got a, a new house, moved them into a shed in the backyard. And again, you know, same issue. It's uh, it's winter again. It's chilly. And I thought, uh, you know, hey, why not take that same PC that we used for our little garden and uh, put it out in the chicken shed, connect it up. And as you can see, the chickens actually love to hang out with it. Um, it's, you know, putting out a lot of heat. So that's, that's fantastic. Uh, my chicken, Anna, hanging out and, uh, you know, supervising our mining operation there. Anna and Elsa, the chickens, I'm assuming named by your, by your kids. Uh, Absolutely. But maybe not. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, what are we going to name the chickens? Of course, Anna and Elsa. Um, is that is that bad for the hardware, leaving it exposed like that in a chicken coop? I just have to imagine it's going to get feathers. super dirty and yeah, feathers. Yeah. So that's the thing. I mean, they um, I actually, you know, I've had to take it out a couple of times um, because they they like to hang out with it. And they also are drawn to little LEDs and lights and things. So they haven't managed to knock the PC over, um, but I put a Nest camera in there. And uh, I've come back several times and found that they've completely destroyed it. So um, maybe they don't like the surveillance aspects or they have some privacy <laughs> concerns, but I often come back in the morning and uh, I think they, they uh, see the little light and attack it. So we end up <laughs> with a broken nest camera on the floor of the coop. <laughs> A nest in the nest. I'm exactly. sorry I have to say it. <laughs> oh, go. wow. This is, I love that just like a chicken foreman who's looking over the, or I should say four person, uh, who's looking over the mining operation. It's just delightful. Um, you talked about the simple, Simplicity. You 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 know downloaded this program and you clicked a button and and that kind of worked for you. But then you started talking about overclocking and things like that. Um, obviously, this this takes a lot of research. I think one of the things that can be helpful if people are kind of wanting to get into this, where where did you start in terms of knowing, okay, this is the graphics card that I need to get. These are the applications that are out there. Is this just research that you compiled on your own? Was there, you know, someone who went out before you and was doing this and you were able to kind of follow along? How did you come up in the end with the mining operation that you have in place now? It was a lot of, you know, just reading things online, um, you know, watching YouTube videos, uh, I just recently actually, though, summarized uh, the mining aspects of, uh, of what I did in an article on debugger, debugger.medium.com, where I write. Um, and I, uh, I just did an article, a new series I'm doing called Tech Shortcuts for Life. And it's these sort of simple, um, you know, things you can do to, uh, to use tech in your life. So I looked at, you know, if you've never mined Bitcoin before, if you have no idea what a blockchain is, how can you kind of experiment with these technologies? And you probably don't want to start out by building a, uh, you know, a cryptocurrency chicken coop, um, but maybe you just want to, you know, kind of dip a, a toe in and um, get some hands-on experience with the, these kinds of technologies. So I, I wrote up, um, you know, kind of the resources that I turned to, the software that I used, um, next steps. You know, if you um, download a program like NiceHash, start it up, and you say, well, this is really cool. You know, I want to explore it more. Um, there's other tools you can get like MSI Afterburner for doing underclocking or overclocking. Um, and, uh, you know, you can obviously start to do more custom builds and adding graphics cards and getting motherboards that can accommodate 10 or, or more graphics cards. Um, so I tried to share all those resources and just summarize them in a way that people can step through the process from, you know, I've never, never actually worked with these before. Um, I want to press one button and start mining all the way up to, you know, I want to buy an ASIC machine and I want to get, you know, dedicated hardware and, uh, and really go into this in a lot more depth. So obviously this is more sustainable than, uh, than like having a, a Bitcoin mining system, you know, inside of an enclosed closet or something like stashed away, right? Like there you're just burning energy to mine crypto. Here you're burning energy, yes, but you're also, you know, growing actual living things, plants, animals, that sort of thing. So there's a sustainable um, aspect to it. But talk a little bit about the environmental cost just in general about Bitcoin mining machines, because I've seen they're actually quite costly as far as that's concerned. They take so much energy to power themselves. Yeah, I mean, it's a. I think it's a huge challenge um, with cryptocurrencies in general because, yeah, when the. I mean, when my computer was mining, it would use over 200 watts of power just to run that graphics card, 
And I was doing it still on a really small scale. I mean, this was at the time generating about 75 cents per day in mining revenue um, with the sort of run up in crypto. It's now up to about maybe a dollar 30, a dollar 50. So it's still a really small scale. And even then it's using a couple hundred watts and it's putting out um, all of that energy is heat. So it's really, um, you know, it, I, I figured out when I put it into my greenhouse, if I piped all of the heat in, it would actually raise the temperature by about 40 degrees and cook my tomatoes. So I had to come up with a way oh, to, wow. uh, to modulate it. So that's the kind of heat you're dealing with. And when you scale that up to the overall scale of, um, you know, a, a network like for Bitcoin, it uses more power than many countries at this point, more power than the country of Switzerland. And, um, you know, with the, the run up in pricing and more people getting into it, they say it now uses um, as much power as a, a country with about, uh, I think, 200 million uh, citizens. So it's a, a huge environmental cost. And one of the things that I also looked at was, can you mine crypto using solar power? Um, and that's one of the things where I'm really starting to explore it more and um, and looking at putting some solar panels on top of that chicken shed, um, using the uh, the energy from that to charge batteries and to run the cryptocurrency mining computer that's heating that space um, over over uh, the daytime and using the batteries to run it at night and actually running the whole thing on solar so that we're not you know contributing to the environmental footprint. And I think that's something that could work. Uh, at a very small scale with what I'm doing, but I think it could also work at a much larger scale, either for homeowners that have solar panels on their home already and they're not using all the capacity, or even for these sort of larger commercial um, solar operations. Yeah, no kidding. So, and and I should uh, I should say, you know, like I said, you've been. You've been kind of writing about this for the last year. The Wall Street Journal kind of interviewed you for their article that came out recently. Over the course of that time, in your kind of experimentation and kind of playing around with this idea to find different new ways and things to apply this this technology to, have people reached out to you with things that they're doing? Like, has anyone said, here's a creative thing that I'm doing with my crypto mining machine? A lot. Yeah, definitely. So I'd say I get probably two or three like random investors reaching out per week trying to pitch me, you know, I'm building this giant solar farm in the desert and uh, and will you consult for me and that kind of thing. Um, yes. I don't know if it's wow. spam. I don't wow. know if it's for real, um, but certainly since crypto has surged, I've seen a big uptick in that. Um, mm -hmm. What I get a lot of, though, is just, you know, people reaching out who are more on the engineering side, like you said, you know, exploring resources to uh, to start to do this themselves and wondering how to do it. So I get a lot of requests for the bill of materials for the, the computer that I built. Um, and I try to share as much of that in the posts again on debugger and medium, um, some of my other channels there. Um, but, you know, I think um, there's a ton of interest in it right now. And I think as much as there can be these sort of creative solutions for using the heat from um, these computers and also supplying power for these computers that are doing cryptocurrency mining in a more sustainable way, we need as many ideas as we can get. And um, the Wall Street Journal article that I was featured in um, talked a little bit about people who are using cryptocurrency mining computers to heat their homes um, or to you know, uh, otherwise sort of do something productive instead of just venting all that heat to the outside. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Well, uh, Tom, it's a, it's a pleasure reading your experimentation and I'm, uh, I'm impressed by your creativity and thought into this because <laughs> I think so a lot cool. of people would think, Oh, Bitcoin, you know, the, the price is, is gone through the roof. I just want to mine it cause I want to make money. And, and there is this other side to it where it's like, Oh, wait a minute, what is the byproduct of that? How can that be useful as well? And that takes creativity. So I give you total props for that. Uh, really cool stuff. Uh, Tom, if people want to find follow you online obviously your your piece is on debugger debugger.medium.com but if people want to follow you online where can they do so the best thing is to follow me at twitter um, at, at tom smith 585 on twitter um, and yeah if you want to follow me and follow debugger.medium.com i think i have about five stories coming out there over the next week and a half uh, so you can follow along there and um, i'm hoping Thanks. to also publish on medium some of the things i talked about like a breakdown of all the parts in my computer if people want to duplicate this or you know experiment with these technologies themselves right on all right well thank you so much for uh for reaching out and coming on the show today we appreciate it it's good to see you thanks so much for having me that. all right take care and best of luck with your crypto mining all right up next 
It's our stories of the week. And Micah, you've got the first one. All right. So um, my story of the week is uh, was originally going to be uh, about Apple's new VR headset, but we luckily got an expert on to talk about that. And so I did a pivot. And I am talking about a, you, you know, Pebble, uh, mm-hmm. maker of the, I, I want to say at least the most popular, um, among the first smartwatches that were on the the market, this was the, the most popular of those, the e-ink smartwatch. Well, the, uh, founder, I believe of, uh, Pebble has created, um, is, is working now on something else, you know, you, you pivot and he, uh, he pivoted as well and is now working on something called Beeper, B-E-E-P-E-R, you know, like pagers are also called mm-hmm. beepers. And this is potentially a brilliant uh, creation. Um, Beeper is a chat app that aims to unify all of the different places that you out there talk uh, with people online. So think SMS, think um, Slack, think uh, WeChat, think, uh, let's see, what else? I want to read these because there's one that I'm leaving until the end. So uh, think WhatsApp, think Facebook Messenger, SMS, Telegram, Twitter DMs, Slack, uh, Google Hangouts, Skype, IRC, what? And think iMessage, believe it or not. And these are the apps that Beeper is aiming to bring together. Um, This is the attempt to make it possible for you to uh, be able to communicate with anyone on any platform and not have to be tied to a specific device. And this is pretty dadgum wild. So... The way that, you know, it, it's it's kind of easy to think about how uh, this ties in with Twitter DMs, for example, because I can go to the App Store right now and pay for or download a free Twitter app, not the Twitter app, but a third-party Twitter app, log in with my credentials, and then send direct messages to people on Twitter. And that's because Twitter has an API, uh, you know, at the, at the back of it that these apps can interface with. And Slack is the same way. I can set up um, a, a webhook that when I hit a button on my stream deck here, uh, automatically sends a message to Jason Howell that says, how you doing, pal and so that's because there's an api in you know the in slack sys service that lets you connect but imessage is a little bit different imessage is apple's own proprietary uh methodology for communicating with other folks who have imessage and it is notoriously um one of the reasons that folks stay with apple once they've gone to apple and uh, w- notoriously one of the reasons that some folks get left out of conversations. Uh, in fact, not too long ago, um, my partner was talking about the group chat that he has with his coworkers and how everybody except for one person is uh, an iPhone user and therefore uses iMessage. And because the group message includes this person, it kind of messes things up in uh, in the way that they communicate with one another. So uh, there are, you know, complaints there about that. And it just, it makes me feel for people who uh, are on Android who do communicate with other people. And Jason, I'm not going to lie. Uh, there have been a few times where, you know, we've messaged back and forth and I have thought, Oh man, I kind of want to just talk to him in I don't know, Twitter DM or Slack or something because it feels so old school to talk with uh, over SMS because like I can't see that my message is sent. I can't do little um, thumbs ups on the message, and so it just feels like every time I send an SMS. I'm concerned that it's not going to deliver or it's going to deliver yeah. three times or there's going to be, you know, some issue with it. And so for me, uh, I see that as, as part of the, the beauty of this. But then let's talk about the fact that this works with iMessage. That is unheard of because you have to have an Apple ID and use one of Apple's devices to be able to communicate over iMessage. So uh, Beeper has come up with this way 
uh, for someone who has a Mac that's always online, uh, which, you know, people who have Macs, uh, if it's not a MacBook, if it's if it's an actual, you know, iMac or uh, Mac mini or something like that, chances are it's at home and it's plugged in and it's in use and it's connected to the internet. And so they figured out a way to use that as a relay for the service. But if someone doesn't have a Mac, they have figured out a way. Uh, they're installing the Beeper app on old iPhones and shipping those out to different uh, people that are using the service. And then the iPhone connects to Wi-Fi and acts as a bridge to let the person communicate over iMessage within the Beeper app. So I, for example, could just install that um, <laughs> oh, and by the way, Burke has uh, just messaged me over SMS to let me know that he does receive my SMSs. Um, but if I had this application, I could see that right next to my blue bubbles, right next to my Slack messages, right next to my, like, this is so, I would love this. I would absolutely love this. And I love the idea that um, no matter what somebody, no matter what I'm communicating with with people, I know that I'll get those messages. And Beeper is, um, it's a private uh, service for now. You can go to Beeper HQ and uh, click on the get started button and then you fill out this form. And then if they uh, want to invite you in, then you can become a part of this. Uh, the service costs 10 bucks a month. It's a subscription fee to be able to use these. Um, but it also has the ability to, it's built on an open source protocol called Matrix. And Matrix is the kind of backbone of open messaging that uses end-to-end -end encryption, that hooks up with the SDKs and APIs, that does the bridging between these different things, that does voice over IP. And so what Beeper has done is create a system on top of Matrix and use that as its, um, its messaging protocol. And then Beeper works to uh, kind of tie those things together and give a nice, you know, beautiful user interface for it. But what's neat is that you can actually go to uh, the, uh, what am I trying to say, Beeper's GitLab and download the source code and use this absolutely for free by running it on your own uh, servers if you want to. So all of this is very cool to me. Um, I have gone on and, uh, you know, signed up to hopefully get an invite because I do want to try this out. I want to see uh, what it's like to be able to message all of my people in one place instead of having to hop app to app or browser to browser. And that way I know that even if I'm on an Android device, I can still send messages to my iMessage folks in iMessage form and not have that be an issue and that they all just show up in one place. It makes me want to cry. This is so cool. Uh, so the different networks that Beeper supports include uh, Beeper itself, Signal, Discord, Matrix, IRC, Skype, Instagram, Hangouts, Slack, Twitter, Telegram, Android, which is SMS right now. Um, and I think that uh, I read that they're you know working to include the future technology, which I can't think of what it's called, but you might know what it is, Jason. RCS? RCS, yes. Yeah. Um, iMessage, Facebook Messenger, and WhatsApp. So I'm keeping my eye on Beeper. And I think that it's very interesting that Eric um, Migakovsky, I'm sorry, Eric, if I'm mispronouncing your last name, the founder of Pebble, uh, said, you know what? I'm getting sick of the fact that I have to communicate on all these different platforms and a bunch of different apps. So you know what? I'm just going to make it all happen right here uh, in yeah. one. And you can read um, the Verge article uh, explains kind of what uh, this is. I don't know if I linked it in. Let me see. Uh, yeah, I did. Okay. So yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. with that, there's a link to Eric's um, post on Medium called the Universal Communication Bus, where he talks about the problems with chat, how everything is siloed, and where he went on to build uh, this tool, and then uh, links to and talks about Matrix. And so I've been reading about Matrix now. I've been reading about... Um, uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. I already forgot what's called Beeper and all of these technologies. And I just think it's very cool. Um, so yeah, uh, awesome. I think everybody should check it out and see uh, what they think about Beeper.
I'm curious to see how it works. Um, it, it instantly reminds me of an app that I used man, years ago called Trillion, which was a multi IM message client. So it would take in, you know, IRC and uh, like all the different chat clients would go into this one app and you could manage them in there. So I'm, I'm familiar with what it's like to manage all of my chats through a single app. And it was actually great for a number of years. Trillion was super popular. I'm not sure exactly what happened, but uh, maybe it was kind of more of the move towards social media and DMs and stuff happening outside of like a, like an easier to implement like chat standard, like IRC. I'm not sure, mm -hmm. but uh, apparently Trillion's still around. And then it also reminded me that I've heard of a few times over the years where people have done something similar to this as far as bringing iMessage onto Android. In fact, there's a company or an app called AirMessage uh, yes. that is similar to what you're talking about. It's it's yep. running on a on a Mac server basically, That's or you got the idea. app running on a server, and then it just reroutes the iMessage over to uh, Android. So the, the pieces are there and they have existed. Um, but sometimes I feel like a Apple has targeted these ads, uh, these apps in the past to say, Hey, that's not okay. And I don't know if maybe, maybe they're doing something different here, uh, than has happened in the past. And, and like I said, air message still exists. So maybe they're doing something different too, cause they're still around. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'll be, I'd be curious to see how, how it's implemented and everything. Having a, a machine running always in order to route the messages like that might turn some people off. I wonder if you could take like a uh, like an Apple uh, TV device and do that because those are always just kind of on anyways. Yeah, plugged in, yeah. That would mm. be nice. That would be nice to be able to do that. But I don't know that you can. But uh, yeah, super curious. I mean, I feel like iMessage on Android uh, for a lot of people is like Final Frontier as far as messaging is concerned. It's that one thing that's like, damn it, Apple still has the iMessage aspect of things over Android, you know what I mean? Yes. It's like why can't why can't Apple just support Android? And I understand why why they don't and continue not to. Um, so we end up in the situation it's, where people are trying to figure it out, anyways. It's an ongoing cry, though, from both sides uh, that yeah. they should like please do this. So I I wish for it too. Um, it is a non-trivial deal, but um, yeah, it, I, I would love yeah. to see that for sure. We'll see but in the happens. meantime, I'm definitely going to be checking this out. I think it's interesting, and I uh, am looking forward to seeing how it works. What about Indeed. you? What's your story? Uh, would you eat artificial intelligence, Micah? Oh, um, that one. AIOs <laughs> like Cheerios. Yeah. Sure. AI, yeah, AIOs for breakfast. Uh, Google Cloud team had, was taking a look at a, a recent uptick in search. Uh, activity and interest around baking, which you can think why, right? Like for the last year, we've been homebound. Uh, so a lot of people are doing a lot more cooking, a lot more people searching and baking. I know that's totally the case in our household. My 10-year-old uh, daughter, almost 11, um, she has in the last year become an amazing dessert like chef. Like she makes desserts almost every week for us, bakes something. It's almost always new and it's always good. Like I'm amazed. I'm like, okay, follow your heart here because you're onto something. <laughs> so anyways, awesome. there's a lot of interest around it. Uh, well, the Google Cloud team realized that. They use machine learning to collect and analyze hundreds of cookie recipes, cake recipes, and bread recipes. And they analyzed all that data just to like be able to locate like common elements, common uh, amounts between between these recipes. Uh, and then they used a Google product called Auto ML Tables to build machine learning uh, models for tagging things that are out there like breads, cookies, and cakes, and got really good at that. And then also tagging hybrids like a bread and a cookie, like, you know, it might see something and have a hard time deciphering between the two, or maybe it blurs those lines. So they would call it a, a brekkie, for instance. Well, the, the artificial intelligence then spit out some recipes uh, based on those combinations <laughs> and the engineers actually went the next step and made the recipes to test them out. And I, I don't know. I just think this is so cool. Cakey, which is a cake and a cookie hybrid, which they said when they made it has the crispness of a cookie and the cakiness of a cake on the inside. And then Brekkies, which is a bread cookie, which they said were more like fluffy cookies, almost the consistency of a muffin. So, 
AI is baking food, like coming up with recipes that haven't been tested. And then we're making those recipes and realizing that it's it's food that's totally edible and actually good. And if you want to make some of these recipes, you can. The, the, the cakey and the brekkies uh, recipes are attached to the blog post that the Google Cloud team put out on this. Uh, I just think it's... I'm, you know, anyone that watches this show with any sort of length, you know, knows that I'm endlessly fascinated by the creative aspects and the creative uses of artificial intelligence and this like blurring, blurring of the lines between what a computer can do and what a human can do. And suddenly, like suddenly the computer's becoming as creative as a human. And it's just, it blows my mind that a computer is writing a recipe that actually turns into real food. That's good. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, this is. This is wild to me. Um, yeah, it, and it does get scary. Uh, I there, there's a. I'm not going to name the show because I don't want to do spoilers. But um, there is a show in which a character uh, is a coder and is sort of like into gaming and all the all these kinds of things and like Atari and and early games. This is you know sort of back in the day, <laughs> a little bit and. In it, um, the character's dad is just super into classical music and is constantly trying to show his son and get his son into classical music. And the son sort of appreciates it, but is like, bro, I've got my own thing here that I'm doing. I'm interested in this. And so um, in order to get back to the gaming, he would put down his controller for a minute, go over and play the piano like an absolute virtuoso, and then as soon as practice was done, you know, as soon as the song ended, whoop, right back to the game. And the dad was kind of disappointed with it. But um, the dad, he felt like he finally had a breakthrough with the son by kind of explaining that, you know, this is how uh, uh, people like us pray, essentially. And the son ended up coding a program that could create music. And so it had taken in all of these classical works and used them to create music. And the son was kind of explaining, the problem is whenever I first was doing this, the music came out sounding a little too stodgy, uh, if we can use a great British bake-off term, and uh, not very interesting. And so I introduced errors, you know, changes, uh, an element of, of, um, of improv. And in doing so, uh, he plays this piece on the piano and this is the first time he's showing it to his dad and his dad, you know, about cries and then says, did you write that? And his son's like, no, that computer did. And then of course the dad is disappointed, but it, <laughs> in the end, it's like this really cool thing and shows mm -hmm. that a computer can be creative in a way. And that is both terrifying and fascinating. And I just hover somewhere in between those two uh, whenever I see stuff like this. Yeah, I'm super fascinated by it. Like getting to the point in, you know, we've had these stories on before about, about art and about making music where we, where we get to this point to where that art or that music is something that if you didn't know a machine was responsible for it, you could still still connect to it and appreciate it for what it is. And maybe it even has an emotional element to it, right? Like I've seen some art that computers have created and I guarantee you if I didn't know that it was a computer and thought it was a person, I'd connect to it on an emotional level. Uh, but, but the moment I know that the computer created it, it's like, it's kind of like a steel wall comes down. I was like, oh, okay, so that's an algorithm that created it. Doesn't it doesn't remove my fascination at all? And I think we're because I think we're headed even further into a direction where all this stuff becomes indecipherable. And yeah, it's 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 kind of frightening to think about what that looks like twenty years down the line. Um, but uh, but yeah, I'm just I'm so fascinated by it. Uh, it's just it's an element of technology that I'm not certain. I would ever see in my lifetime. And here we are. And like actually already pretty convincingly we're seeing it. So who knows where that leads in 20 years. Right. 
uh, probably the same place that uh, driverless cars are are going to be in 20 years. You know? <laughs> wow. Frees us up for other things. Why should we be creative anymore? The robots are already doing it. So what do we do? When instead? the driverless cars are playing music at concerts <laughs> and going to see each other at concerts yes. and we're all just sitting at home like, um, you were supposed to pick me up. I needed to get to football practice. And the driverless car was like, <laughs> I had a performance to watch. I had other plans. Get your own ride. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, kid. <laughs> <laughs> I guess the, in my yeah. mind, the driverless car is a smoker too. I had a performance <laughs> to watch. <laughs> I, they me, talk bro. about emissions. I thought we were done with those things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Artificial emissions. <laughs> oh, interesting stuff. Oh, golly. All right. Well, we've reached the end of Tech News Weekly. Uh, we do this show every Thursday, and you can watch live, of course, twit.tv slash live. But most of you are getting it in podcast, and you can find all the information you need to do that at twit.tv slash TNW. All the details for how to subscribe can be found there. Oh, also, uh, I should mention real quick, twit.tv slash survey21, almost forgot, um, closes in February. So this is just your opportunity to let us know what you like about what we're doing, uh, ways that we can improve what we're doing, what you're missing out of the shows, what you really love. And it's all, you know, it's all anonymous. We're not collecting data necessarily. What we're doing here is kind of understanding what you want out of our shows and out of this network and what's working for you. So we really appreciate it. It closes in February, so uh, do it now, twit.tv slash survey21. And where are we? Ah, follow us on uh, social media. We are at twit.tv on Instagram, at twittalk on TikTok. Uh, and I know that if you, if you want to follow Leo, you can find him over on Mastodon, which is sort of the federated version of Twitter. Um, you can also follow me on social media. I'm at Micah Sargent on pretty much all of the social platforms or head to chihuahua.coffee, C-H-I-H-U-A-H-U-A.coffee, because that's the site where I've got links to all the places I exist online. And of course, check out iOS Today and Smart Tech Today. Uh, Smart Tech Today will be out later today, uh, live later today, rather, uh, and out later in the evening as well. What about you, Jason? Well, uh, you can just find me over on Twitter at Jason Howell. Uh, what I'll plug for today is a review that went up on Hands on Tech yesterday that I'm really proud of. Uh, it's the C64, which is a Commodore 64. Maybe replica is the wrong word for it. It's basically it's a, it's a Commodore 64 emulation machine, but the hardware is almost nearly identical to the original hardware. And it's a full working keyboard and uh I just loved it. it, and I continue to love it. It was such a fun review to work on. It wasn't even it wasn't even work. It was just a pure enjoyment. So twit.tv slash hot to go check out my totally nerdy review. You'll learn a little bit about me and my childhood uh, by watching that review. Uh, big thanks to everybody at the studio helping us do this show. John Ashley Burke behind the scenes as well, and thanks to you for watching and listening each and every week. We'll see you next time on Tech News Weekly. Bye, everybody. Hey folks, thanks for tuning in to another show here on the Twit Network. If you are a fan of home automation, Internet of Things, and all things smart technology, you should check out my podcast, Smart Tech Today. I do it with Matthew Casanelli, and we have so much fun talking about all the latest news for all things smart tech.